Well, you know, right after the war was over, many people were predicting a depression. Which war are you talking about? World War II. Many people were predicting a depression. But the economy took off like crazy, in part helped by the fact that we promoted a Cold War, which was good for the armaments industry. But along with the rapid industrialization of this country came for the first time a consciousness of how badly polluted our air and our water were. And the League of Women Voters in 1947 undertook to study Lake Erie. Remember, it was so dirty that you could actually throw a match in and it would burn. Then they went and studied Hudson River, the Connecticut River, the Susquehanna River, and everywhere they looked, the water was polluted. So this became... The scientists got into it. They began to analyze where the pollution was coming from, and we quickly found out that our abuse of energy or our overuse or our misuse of energy was the principal source of pollution in the air and the water. Where were you during all this time? This is 1948, you say, 1947? Yes. Uh, I was in science-based industry. I was working for scientific companies. And naturally, I tried to keep abreast of what would happen once the people began to realize that industry was causing most of this pollution. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that looked as if it would relieve the pollution beautifully was the advent of peaceful nuclear power because you can get electricity without using oxygen, without having any combustion products, by the process of nuclear fission. And so, just at the time when our cities were so polluted with coal fumes that we were mandating a change to oil burning electric power plants, then of course we realized that stationary pollution was causing only 14% of the air pollution, that most of it was coming from cars and trucks, and that began the first wave of legislation designed to cut back on automobile exhausts and pollutants. But industry was very enthusiastic about the possibility of using nuclear power as a replacement for fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And I was at that time with a very large chemical company that had an interest in the development of nuclear power because we had supplied all of the basic fluorine which is used as one step in the process of enriching nuclear fuel. It has to be turned, the uranium has to be turned into uranium hexafluoride before it can be enriched. Which company were you working for? Allied Chemical uh -huh. in Morristown, New Jersey. During the 19, late 1950s, the first of the nuclear plants that were being built under the Eisenhower Adams for Peace program were coming online and they were being placed in areas that were most highly polluted, in and around Chicago, in and around New York City. The idea of clean power was something that Con Edison immediately adopted and put on all their trucks. Because it does appear that nuclear power, compared to what comes out of a soft coal factory, is really a clean substance. But the invisible materials that are emitted by a nuclear power plant are far worse pollutants than anything that ever came out of a coal-fired plant. However, they're invisible, and you can say clean, and it is clean insofar as a visual inspection is concerned. Anyway, this caught the popular imagination because no scientific advance has ever been promoted as thoroughly and glamorized the way the Atomic Energy Commission glamorized nuclear power. This is all during the 19th Yes. It looked like a great boon. It looked like our whole way of life would change. Admiral Strauss, who was the atomic energy head, predicted that electricity would be so cheap from nuclear plants that you wouldn't have to meter it. <laughs> it took quite a while for people to realize that anything that was advertised as so perfect must have something wrong with it. See, nuclear power had been developed by chemists, engineers, physicists, people who dealt with non-living matter. If there had been biologists involved from the beginning, there would have been much more attention paid to the fact that you cannot get fission energy by splitting an atom of uranium or plutonium 
without getting a host of deadly byproducts. You might call them the radioactive ashes that are left. And as a matter of fact, you get more waste than the starting material because everything that the waste touches becomes radioactive. And if we could only impress people with just one fact, I think that the whole thing would collapse. And that fact is that radioactive fission products are from one million to one billion times more toxic than any industrial poison, you know, like cyanide or prussic acid or vinyl chloride or any of these substances that are so much in the news now. In spite of 30 years of research and billions of dollars spent in trying to find ways to handle and manage this waste, there are no ways to do it. We're face to face with the fact that only eternal perpetual surveillance is going to protect us from the long-term consequences of letting this waste get out into the environment. At the mine, at the milling station, in the enrichment, the transportation, the fabrication, and the operation of the nuclear power plant itself, quantities of radiation escape into the environment, having the consequence that we're now killing on the average of 100 people a day from these waste that we can't control, the waste that start right at the beginning. And based on the amount of radiation that people are getting today, we think that plutonium particularly will have this tremendous genetic kick, which will only be registered in the generation that will start reproducing around the year 2000. There was no limit as long as you called it the peaceful atom. And of course, this was a reaction to the great sense of guilt so many scientists and people in government felt over the Hiroshima Nagasaki. And here, 35 years later, we're still, in a sense, trying to wash away that guilt by spending more money now for fast breeder reactors. All of the environmentalists were terribly disappointed two weeks ago when they saw the new Department of Energy projections for the next five years. Because Carter has gone back on his pledge, made as recently as February, to see that our spending for energy would bring us to a point that we would have 20% of all our energy by the year 2000 supplied by solar. It is easily achievable. It is not an impossible thing at all. But now they're going to trim $250 million out of the solar budget and they're going to add two billion to the fast breeder budget. The reason why industry got into this program in the first instance was the threat by the government that if industry didn't go along and build nuclear power plants, the government would. So the government had to make a demonstration and the demonstration they made was the shipping port reactor in Pennsylvania where they had a decided advantage because this reactor had been made for an aircraft carrier. And then when Congress decided we didn't need a nuclear propelled aircraft carrier, it became surplus. So the AEC, in cahoots with Duquesne Light and Power Company outside of Pittsburgh, put up this aircraft carrier reactor unit, which was beautifully engineered according to Admiral Rickover's tight specifications. It was a beautiful plant. It became a showplace. People came from all over the world to see the first American light water reactor. Anyway, the breeder, as the name suggests, uses fast neutrons to bombard worthless uranium, the kind that you can't use in present day nuclear plants. In bombarding that worthless material, you turn it into plutonium, which is worth 10 times the price of gold. It is an extremely valuable material, not only for nuclear power plant fuel, but for building atomic weapons. And as you suspect, the reason why so many countries are interested in acquiring nuclear power plants is not their vision of having a cheap source of electricity, but having ready access to plutonium so that they may join the nuclear weapons club. Nothing has happened in breeder research except the French have developed 
such a satisfactory design that they're now getting into mass production on it. Germany has a breeder of its own, England has one, Russia has one. And now the argument is, uh, why shouldn't the United States, which with Carter's ascension to the presidency in 1976, abandoned, put on the shelf, breeders and reprocessing, why shouldn't the United States get back into the business of breeders? according to the lessons we've learned at Three Mile Island. And briefly, that lesson is, according to Henry Kendall of the Union of Concerned Scientists, that in the event of a major nuclear accident, we could expect lethal radiation at distances as far as 90 miles away. So the matter of coping with evacuation in the densely populated East Coast is manifestly impossible. Mm -hmm. Well, this looks almost like a triumph for common sense and the public welfare. But you can see it can very be easily be used by the nuclear industry to say, OK, we'll give up some of these questionable locations, and we'll start with a better reactor, which we will isolate in energy parks in remote parts of the country, where we will have a complete self-contained reprocessing plant waste burial, waste storage. Trucks won't have to go over the highways. This will all be tucked away in an area where people wouldn't be affected even if there were an accident. And by putting it in a self-sufficient park, we'll be able to guarantee security. These will be government-protected facilities run by government agencies, like the Power Authority of New York, like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, like the Tennessee Valley Authority, like the Bonneville Power Administration. The private utilities will only buy this power and retail it, but they will not manufacture it. You know the Power Authority, since 1972, has been acquiring property up there, and now they intend to build at least one more pump storage plant at Prattsville. They will very shortly have more than 6,000 acres up there, which is a good-sized reservation that they can carefully screen and guard and control. And they will also have enough water stored in the upland storage basins of the pump storage plants to cool nuclear power plants. Well, it's been speculated from the beginning that the power authority, which already operates two nuclear plants, would become the operator of nuclear plants throughout the area. They are now assembling a top-notch team of specialists, engineers, plant operators, and in line with the feeling now that this is too big a responsibility for small electric utilities to operate these plants, the logical thing would be for a government entity to do it. And so all I can say is that all signs point to the fact that a choice location for an energy park, a breeder, waste storage dump, would be the Pasney Reservation. And if we can tell people how hazardous radioactive materials are, maybe we'll begin to see the awesome power of the nuclear arsenals that we have built up. If we had never had nuclear weapons, we never would have had nuclear power plants because the industry has been subsidized by the enormous investments that the government made during World War II 